Section forty six of Gray's Anatomy, Part two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bologna Times. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part two, by Henry Gray. The Muscles and Fascia of the Forearm. The muscles and fascia of the forearm. Antibrachial fascia, fascia antibrachii, deep fascia of the forearm. The antibrachial fascia, continuous above with the brachial fascia, is a dense membranous investment, which forms a general sheath for the muscles in this region. It is attached behind to the olecranon and dorsal border of the ulna and gives off from its deep surface numerous intermuscular septa which enclose each muscle separately over the flexor tendons as they approach the wrist it is especially thickened and forms the volar carpal ligament this is continuous with the transverse carpal ligament and forms a sheath for the tendon of the palmaris longus which passes over the transverse carpal ligament to be inserted into the palmar aponeurosis. Behind, near the wrist joint, it is thickened by the addition of many transverse fibers and forms the dorsal carpal ligament. It is much thicker on the dorsal than on the volar surface and at the lower than at the upper part of the forearm and is strengthened above by tendinous fibers derived by the biceps brachii in front and from the triceps brachii behind it gives origin to muscular fibers especially at the upper part of the medial and lateral sides of the forearm and forms the boundaries of a series of cone-shaped cavities in which the muscles are contained besides the vertical septa separating the individual muscles transverse septa are given off both on the volar and dorsal surfaces of the forearm separating the deep from the superficial layers of muscles apertures exist in the fascia for the passage of vessels and nerves one of these apertures of large size situated at the front of the elbow serves for the passage of a communicating branch between the superficial and deep veins the antibrachial or forearm muscles may be divided into a volar and a dorsal group. The volar antibrachial muscles. These muscles are divided for convenience of description into two groups, superficial and deep. The superficial group. Pronator teres, palmaris longus, flexor carpe radialis, flexor carpe ulnaris, flexor digitorum sublimus. The muscles of this group take origin from the media epicondyle of the humerus by a common tendon. They receive additional fibers from the deep fascia of the forearm near the elbow and from the septa which pass from this fascia between the individual muscles. The pronator teres has two heads of origin, humeral and ulnar. The humeral head, the larger and more superficial, arises immediately above the medial epicondyle and from the tendon common to the origin of the other muscles, also from the intermuscular septum between it and the flexor carpe radialis and from the antibrachial fascia. The ulnar head is a thin fasciculus which arises from the medial side of the coronoid process of the ulna and joins the proceeding at an acute angle. The median nerve enters the forearm between the two heads of the muscle and is separated from the ulnar artery by the ulnar head. The muscle passes obliquely across the forearm and ends in a flat tendon which is inserted into a rough impression at the middle of the lateral surface of the body of the radius. The lateral border of the muscle forms the medial boundary of a triangular hollow 
situated in front of the elbow joint and containing the brachial artery, median nerve, and tendon of the biceps brachii. Variations Absence of ulnar head Additional slips from the medial intermuscular septum from the biceps and from the brachialis anticus occasionally occur. The flexor carpi radialis lies on the medial side of the preceding muscle. It arises from the medial epicondyle by the common tendon, from the fascia of the forearm, and from the intermuscular septa between it and the pronator teres laterally, the palmaris longus medially, and the flexor digitorum sublimus beneath. Slender and aponeurotic in structure at its commencement, it increases in size and ends in a tendon which forms rather more than the lower half of its length. This tendon passes through a canal in the lateral part of the transverse carpal ligament and runs through a groove on the greater multangular bone. The groove is converted into a canal by fibrous tissue and lined by a mucous sheath. The tendon is inserted into the base of the second metacarpal bone and sends a slip to the base of the third metacarpal bone. The radial artery in the lower part of the forearm lies between the tendon and this muscle and the brachioradialis. Variations. Slips from the tendon of the biceps, the lacertus fibrosus, the coronoid, and the radius have been found. Its insertion often varies and may be mostly into the annular ligament, the trapezium, or the fourth metacarpal as well as the second or third. The muscle may be absent. The palmaris longus is a slender fusiform muscle lying on the medial side of the preceding. It arises from the medial epicondyle of the humerus by the common tendon, from the intermuscular septa between it and the adjacent muscles, and from the antibrachial fascia. It ends in a slender, flattened tendon, which passes over the upper part of the transverse carpal ligament, and is inserted into the central part of the transverse carpal ligament and lower part of the palmar aponeurosis, frequently sending a tendinous slip to the short muscles of the thumb. Variations. One of the most variable muscles in the body. This muscle is often absent about 10% and is subject to many variations. It may be tendinous above and muscular below, or it may be muscular in the center with a tendon above and below, or it may be present two muscular bundles with a central tendon, or finally it may consist solely of a tendinous band. The muscle may be double slips of origin from the coronoid process or from the radius have been seen partial or complete insertion into the fascia of the forearm into the tendon of the flexor carpi ulnaris and pisiform bone into the navicular and into the muscles of the little finger have been observed the flexor carpi ulnaris lies along the ulnar side of the forearm. It arises by two heads, humeral and ulnar, connected by a tendinous arch, beneath which the ulnar nerve and posterior ulnar recurrent artery pass. The humeral head arises from the media epicondyle of the humerus by the common tendon. The ulnar head arises from the medial margin of the olecranon and from the upper two-thirds of the dorsal border of the ulna by an aponeurosis common to it and the extensor carpi ulnaris and flexor digitorum profundus and from the intermuscular septum between it and the flexor digitorum sublimus the fibers end in a tendon which occupies the anterior part of the lower half of the muscle and is inserted into the pisiform bone it is prolonged from this to the hamate and fifth metacarpal bones by the pisohamate and pisometacarpal ligaments. 
it is also attached by a few fibers to the transverse carpal ligament the ulnar vessels and nerve lie on the lateral side of the tendon of this muscle in the lower two-thirds of the forearm variations slips of origin from the coronoid the epitrocleo anoconeus a small muscle often present runs from the back of the inner condyle to the olecranon over the ulnar nerve the flexor digitorum sublimus is placed beneath the previous muscle it is the largest of the muscles of the superficial group and arises by three heads humeral ulnar and radial the humeral head arises from the medial epicondyle of the humerus by the common tendon from the ulnar collateral ligament of the elbow joint and from the intermuscular septa between it and the preceding muscles the ulnar head arises from the medial side of the coronoid process above the ulnar origin of the pronator teres the radial head arises from the oblique line of the radius extending from the radial tuberosity to the insertion of the pronator teres the muscle speedily separates into two planes of muscular fibers superficial and deep the superficial plane divides into two parts which end in tendons for the middle and ring fingers the deep plane gives off a muscular slip to join the portion of the superficial plane which is associated with the tendon of the ring finger and then divides into two parts which end in tendons for the index and little fingers as the four tendons thus formed pass beneath the transverse carpal ligament into the palm of the hand they are arranged in pairs the superficial pair going to the middle and ring fingers the deep pair to the index and little fingers the tendons diverge from one another in the palm and form dorsal relations to the superficial volar arch and digital branches of the median and ulnar nerves opposite the bases of the first phalanges each tendon divides into two slips to allow of the passage of the corresponding tendon of the flexor digitorum profundus the two slips then reunite and form a grooved channel for the reception of the accompanying tendon of the flexor digitorum profundus finally the tendon divides and is inserted into the sides of the second phalanx about its middle variations absence of radial head of little finger portion accessory slips from ulnar tuberosity to the index and middle finger portions from the inner head to the flexor profundus from the ulnar to annular ligament to the little finger the deep group flexor digitorum profundus flexor pollicis longus pronator quadratus the flexor digitorum profundus is situated on the ulnar side of the forearm immediately beneath the superficial flexors it arises from the upper three-fourths of the volar and medial surfaces of the body of the ulna embracing the insertion of brachialis above and extending below to within a short distance of the pronator quadratus it also arises from a depression on the medial side of the coronoid process by an aponeurosis from the upper three-fourths of the dorsal border of the ulna in common with the flexor and extensor carpi ulnaris and from the ulnar half of the interosseous membrane the muscle ends in four tendons which run under the transverse carpal ligament dorsal to the tendons of the flexor digitorum sublimus opposite the first phalanges the tendons pass through the openings in the tendons of the flexor digitorum sublimus and are finally inserted into the bases of the last phalanges the portion of the muscle for the index finger is usually distinct throughout but the tendons for the middle ring and little fingers are connected together by areolar tissue and tendinous slips as far as the palm of the hand fibrous sheaths of the flexor tendons after leaving the palm the tendons of the flexorus digitorum sublimus and profundus 
lie in osseo aponeurotic canals formed behind the phalanges and in front by strong fibrous bands which arch across the tendons and are attached on either side to the margins of the phalanges opposite the middle of the proximal and second phalanges the bands digital vaginal ligaments are very strong and the fibers are transverse but opposite the joints they are much thinner and consist of annular and cruciate ligamentous fibers each canal contains a mucous sheath which is reflected on the contained tendons within each canal the tendons of the flexoris digitorum sublimus and profundus are connected to each other and to the phalanges by slender tendinous bands called vincula tendina there are two sets of these a the vincula brevia which are two in number in each finger and consist of triangular bands of fibers one connecting the tendon of the flexor digitorum sublimus to the front of the the first interphalangeal joint and head of the first phalanx and the other the tendon of the flexor digitorum profundus to the front of the second interphalangeal joint and head of the second phalanx b the vincula longa which connect the under surfaces of the tendons of the flexor digitorum profundus to those of the subjacent flexor sublimus after the tendons of the former have passed through the latter variations the index finger portion may arise partly from the upper part of the radius slips from the inner head of the flexor sublimus medial epicondyle or the coronoid are found connection with the flexor pollicis longus four small muscles the lumbricals are connected with the tendons of the flexor profundus in the palm they will be described with the muscles of the hand the flexor pollicis longus is situated on the radial side of the forearm lying in the same plane as the preceding it arises from the grooved volar surface of the body of the radius extending from immediately below the tuberosity and oblique line to within a short distance of the pronator quadratus it arises also from the adjacent part of the interosseous membrane and generally by a fleshy slip from the medial border of the coronoid process or from the medial epicondyle of the humerus the fibers end in a flattened tendon which passes beneath the transverse carpal ligament is then lodged between the lateral head of the flexor pollicis brevis and the oblique part of the adductor pollicis and entering an osseoaponeurotic canal similar to those for the flexor tendons of the fingers is inserted into the base of the distal phalanx of the thumb the volar interosseous nerve and vessels pass downward on the front of the interosseous membrane between the flexor pollicis longus and flexor digitorum profundus variations slips may connect with flexor sublimus or profundus or pronator teres an additional tendon to the index finger is sometimes found the pronator quadratus is a small flat quadrilateral muscle extending across the front of the lower parts of the radius and ulna it arises from the pronator ridge on the lower part of the volar surface of the body of the ulna from the medial part of the volar surface of the lower fourth of the ulna and from a strong aponeurosis which covers the medial third of the muscle the fibers pass lateral ward and slightly downward to be inserted into the lower fourth of the lateral border and the volar surface of the body of the radius the deeper fibers of the muscle are inserted into the triangular area above the ulnar notch of the radius an attachment comparable with the origin of the supinator from the triangular area below the radial notch of the ulna variations rarely absent split into two or three layers increased attachment upward or downward nerves 
All the muscles of the superficial layer are supplied by the median nerve, excepting the flexor carpi ulnaris, which is supplied by the ulnar. The pronator teres, the flexor carpi radialis, and the palmaris longus derive their supply primarily from the sixth cervical nerve, the flexor digitorum sublimus from the seventh and eighth cervical and first thoracic nerves, and the flexor carpi ulnaris from the eighth cervical and first thoracic. Of the deep layer, the flexor digitorum profundus is applied by the eighth cervical and first thoracic through the ulnar and the volar interosseous branch of the median. The flexor pollicis longus and pronator quadratus are supplied by the eighth cervical and first thoracic through the volar interosseous branch of the median. Actions. These muscles act upon the forearm, the wrist, and hand. The pronator teres rotates the radius upon the ulna, rendering the hand prone. When the radius is fixed, it assists in flexing the forearm. The flexor carpe radialis is a flexor, an abductor of the wrist. It also assists in pronating the hand and in bending the elbow. The flexor carpi ulnaris is a flexor and adductor of the wrist. It also assists in bending the elbow. The palmaris longus is a flexor of the wrist joint. It also assists in flexing the elbow. The flexor digitorum sublimus flexes first the middle and then the proximal phalanges, and then the proximal phalanges. It also assists in flexing the wrist and elbow. The flexor digitorum profundus is one of the flexors of the phalanges. After the flexor sublimus has bent the second phalanx, the flexor profundus flexes the terminal one, but it cannot do so until after the contraction of the superficial muscle. It also assists in flexing the wrist. The flexor pollicis longus is a flexor of the phalanges of the thumb. When the thumb is fixed, it assists in flexing the wrist. The pronator quadratus rotates the radius upon the ulna, rendering the hand prone. End of section 46 Recording by Bologna Times, Tampa, Florida, 2012.